Han Seising Smith. Warm, warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, and saying all those nice things about me. Um, first of course, a goede middag. A goede middag, uh, that's the last word of Dutch that I'll do. A goede middag means good afternoon. So now you know, goede middag. And for the rest we'll do it in English and I hope the translation for those of you uh, that would like that is okay. Um, we talk about uh, retail strategy today. And, uh, but first, I would like to know each other a little bit better. I want to know who of you work in a store. Yeah, right, that's nice. And who of you work at regional offices, if you have those? No? Ah, there, one, two, ah, here, some more. Thank you very much. And who of you work at the headquarters? That must be more or less the rest of it, of course. And then, uh, who of you work in category management? Good, because there was a discussion a bit earlier on how to translate uh, the SKU and the SKU in your language, but I think it's the same, right? Good. Uh, so I will use some more of those terms there. Well, whatever your position, I will give you a tool today that uh, helps you prevent a lot of confusion when it comes to strategy, and it puts common sense into uh, those strategic discussions. And uh, the game I'm going to teach you is the no compromise game. And in about half an hour, three quarters of an hour, you are all strategic retail geniuses with this game. And I will tell you how to be a winner, and uh, in uh, that half an hour, you will know what all these uh, giants are about. Well, just first a little bit about my relevance, why um, you have been so kind to uh, let me fly out here. I'm Hans Eising Smeets, and I'm a worldwide operating uh, retail strategy consultant, and uh, I help uh, brands and retailers to make drastic changes. Um, we work as a very small com company. This is our um, uh, building on uh, the single canal in Amsterdam. I don't know if any of you have been in Amsterdam. This is the most beautiful inner canal of Amsterdam. And we work as a very small mama-papa uh, company. And I mean literally mama-papa company. It's me and it's my wife and it's two sons and it's uh, some support staff, but it's essentially a boutique consultancy uh, Mama Papa company. And we work for large, very large companies all over the world. Um, and these are some of the countries that we've worked in. In the past, um, I would say two, three years, we've worked a lot in Central and Eastern uh, Europe. Um, Serbia, Poland, Romania, um, and uh, so now in Lithuania as well. Um, these are some of the uh, companies that we've worked for. There must be some names that you recognize. Your mother company, Ika. We've worked over the years um, quite a bit for them. And you may uh, know that in the past, Ahold Deleuze from Holland and Ika belong to the same uh, company. What other companies are interesting? Spar, of course, in a number of countries. Migro, there up in the upper right. So many uh, interesting companies we work for. Um, we've... Um, uh, seen uh, not too much of Lithuania yet, so I arrived one half day ago in uh, your beautiful country, r rented a car and started to look at your stores um, and the stores of the competition uh, to, uh, to see what that is. And I asked you about that later. I'm going to tell you about the no compromise game because that's what I promised to you. And uh, I'm going to tell you about the eternal movement in all types of retail and that is the no compromise move. Um, and what we see in many countries is that uh, retail is living in a revolutionary time. Shopping malls, internet, uh, lots of and discounters like Lidl make life difficult. And from what I've seen in the past one and a half days, and agreed only in this area of uh, your beautiful city and not out in the province, I think that is true for Lithuanian retail as well. And the question of course is, and um, this morning there was a discussion, how can we go from 7 to 
that has to do a lot with positioning and how do you position yourself in these revolutionary times. Well, you will understand it after this session. It's no rocket science, we can all understand it because it is on uh, simple economic laws. And this is the game that we're going to play. Um, and first of all, the objective of the no compromise game, that is to seduce her, the consumer. Um, that is the game about it, he or she, but anyway, we're going to seduce the consumer. And what we uh, are going to uh, play for is love chips. So that's the game, earn as many love chips as possible. And then the players in the game, you see different ones in there. And the main ones for this moment are the big retailers. That's you, that's Maxima, that's Lidl, that's all the others. They are competing for the heart of uh, Mrs. Uh, consumer. And then who is the best seducer? So this is what it's all about. You can earn love chips, but when she is not happy about you, you can earn bomb chips as well. And you don't want to earn the bomb chips. You understand it so far, right? Um, this is the game that we're going to play. So how the no compromise positioning model works is the following. And we're going to unpack uh, the game. We're putting the players on the uh, board. And I'm going to tell you what it is all about. Well, this is the game board that we're going to play. And it's all about perception of the consumer. So not facts as such, uh, because I've heard in the briefing before we uh, uh, flew over here that uh, there is a real difference between price perception and price reality. And we're talking about perception in this kind of thing. So what does the consumer think about Price, high price there, a low price there. And what does she love, of course? Um, she loves low price. Uh, that's true in any country that I've worked in, with a, maybe an exception if you walk around in Dubai, in the big malls, you see uh, people that want to show off that they're anything but cheap and they have everything around on their fingers. The, glasses, everything to show that they don't like low prices, but love high prices. But in normal consumer marketing, this is where uh, people uh, love to be. So Mrs. Consumer gives a hard chip there and gives a bomb chip up there. Now, the other axis, that is value, low value and high value. And I must explain to you a little bit about what value means. That's not just quality. It is everything put together. First of all, for retail, it's location. Where is a store? Is it near to me? Is it near to my work? Or is it efficiently on my way from work to home? Uh, it is access. It is ease of, um, of shopping. It is width and uh, depth of assortment. It is surface. It is a lot of different things. And Mrs. Consumer can determine what value means for her. Uh, this morning with loyalty, there was um, discussion about sustainability. Sustainability is one of the value items that is important to consumers everywhere. Um, so that is nothing that you can really make a play out of anymore. It is for everyone, it's there and it's part of the value. So um, Mrs. Consumer loves the uh, higher value and she hates the lower value. So what happens? She gives high value, a uh, love chip there, and uh, low value, a bomb chip there. So if we put it together, it's like this. Um, and we can give names to those um, different quadrants, the segments of the uh, game field. So up there, there's the love value and the hate price um, uh, corner. And we call that the price compromise corner. So I love the value. I hate the price, I accept the compromise for uh, the high value. Um, here is the contrast of that. Here I love the price and I hate the value. And this is of course where all the hard discounters uh, start. Yeah, low prices, but uh, I, uh, I love, uh, uh, the value is not good. Up there, hate value and hate price, double compromise corner. And here we have heaven, love value, and love price. And we call that the no compromise corner. 
So we get it so far, right? Now we're going to plan and plot on this, um, on this diagram. All thinking is like, uh, like this. So we remember it here. And I don't know, uh, has anybody studied marketing? Probably there must be people here. So Michael Porter was probably in your MBA course as well, professor from uh, Harvard, I think. And he tells you that um, people have to accept a uh, compromise either on value or on price. And he says, uh, listen, um, guys, uh, that up there nobody wants to be. We agree on that, of course. And down there, here, you cannot be because the high costs that it would require to give such high value would force you in that direction. So Michael Porter tells us that, um, yeah, tough shit, you have to live on this compromise diagonal. It's either price or value. And customers still ask me, should we take a value proposition or should we take uh, a price proposition? And we say, neither is good, but we'll come to that. So, um, so full service supermarkets would be up there. Soft discounters are there. And hard discounters traditionally are there. And uh, what um, I've heard already this morning and from what I've seen of your stores, you tend to be in the full supermarket corner up there. So you require, from Mrs. Consumer, you require a high price, but you think you offer a high value in return. So new thinking, and that's what we do, we think differently. So I think I've earned a photograph as well. That's me then. Um, I say that's not true because it doesn't work that way. What you see is that hard discounters who start traditionally here, when they grow big, they move in that direction. And they don't go up, they are not forced up like Michael Porter tries to tell you. No, when they go on that journey and they become bigger and bigger and bigger, they can even go down in price because their purchasing power is higher, their, uh, their scale of economy is hitting in as well. And what you see is that these guys, they are from a hard discounter, they are turning into a no compromise player here. Um, and that's magic, but that works all the time. Oh, what do I do? Let's clean up after me. Um, And uh, that's quite clear because uh, it's uh, double uh, love chips there. Um, some examples. IKEA, definitely a no compromise player. And here we see that value is not only quality because you can debate the quality of, um, of uh, IKEA. Will that furniture last for three generations? No, of course not. But today we accept that and we like it that way. Uh, Walmart, definitely a no compromise player. Um, Primark, you have already a Primark here in, in Lithuania? Not yet, but I see some faces who know what Primark is. It's an Irish uh, uh, chain of, um, of fashion, very, very fast fashion, uh, big, big stores, uh, incredible rotation of assortment. So every three or four weeks, Everything is new in a store, very topical. When it's summer, it's really summer there. When it's winter, it's really winter there. And they continue, uh, and it's, the prices are incredible. Uh, Amazon, and uh, very important, Lidl. And you recognize Lidl because Lidl is active in your country as well. Uh, they are seen in that way. They, uh, Lidl, in the old days, in the 60s, they were still very terrible stores. It stank in the stores, um, the, the value was really low, quality was low, the shopping experience was low, the uh, buildings were terrible. Well, we now all know that that is not true anymore. And we in Holland can still remember that Lidl was here, but you in your country, most of your consumers only know it when it's there. They don't know the old Lidl anymore. So they are um, no compromise from day one. So we're getting it now, right? Uh, you're getting an idea of who the winners uh, will be. So, where would I put some of the Lithuanian players on the field? 
To grab that position, first of all, you need structural changes in your thinking. Um, because price compromise players, um, and that's, what I th that's the position where I think you are in as I follow it a bit this morning, and I follow it in the briefings, and I see it in the, in the market. When something is happening and something is scaring a full service retailer, they always tend to go into that direction. Ah, they like us for a choice, let's add even more assortment, let's make more width, Let, let's make more depth, let's make more everything. It's not helping very much, as we've seen, uh, because what, it, what you do is you move yourself off from the game field, and that's not a good place to be. So the only way, and I've done this work now for 40 years, the only way out is if you really have to go and move in this direction. But that hurts, because if you're going down, um, it means that you hit your cost. You can only go down if you uh, do differently on your speed of development, on your cost of development, etc. And not add on more and more and more assortment. And category managers going completely wild and by adding another uh, other 20 brand of pasta. So that's the only way that you go in here. And um, we see with many of... Uh, the kind of companies that you are in, that people have a problem going down that way. So, we're getting it so far? Yes? Okay, then we're making it more difficult, more complex, uh, because the playing field is moving with time. And it always moves in this direction. And I'm going to explain to you um, with a lesson from the fashion sector. Um, and that is with the department stores. What I've learned only today is that you don't have department stores in your country, right? Did you have them any in the old days of the socialist heaven or not? No? Well, you're all too young to know. Yeah, oh, right. Because that in socialist countries was normal that you had a department store as well. But like Karstadt or KDW or um, a Printemps in Paris, department stores, you know what it is. In the old days, and that's, let's say, from the 1950s till the 1990s, they ruled the inner city when it came to fashion. Um, but then, in the past decade, because we're now already two and a half, almost two and a half decades in this century, uh, things started to change. Um, discount uh, fashion change, like Kik from Germany came in, or H&M came in, or a more value, uh, quality, uh, fashion kind of change came in. And what happened then is that the whole game field moved in this direction because people loved it that way. The bosses of those department stores, they sat like that with the fingers in their ears and their eyes closed, and they said, well, H&M is not a department store, so that's no competition. Ha ha. That was competition because they were selling, um, they were selling their uh, their fashion uh, anyway, and so this movement always is happening and it never ends because H and M was then what you see is Primark is moving it in this direction again, and there was a time that Zara moved it in this direction again. H and M has now um, uh, changed their way of working again, and I've seen one of the latest new stores in Frankfurt not long ago, and they really are a threat to Zara again. So uh, what you see is when it moves that way, st shops start to close, like Woolworths in America, Woolworths in England, they're closed, it's over, it's end of the line. Um, so it means that the whole game field moves to the right, it moves down, so it always moves to the southeast direction. And this is something that never stops. Um, and you see that it's end of the line for those kind of stores. So hypermarkets are hit as well. Um, in developed countries like Germany, the hypermarkets were the no-compromise retailer of the 1980s. 
and already before that. They, they called it the SB Warenhäuser, the self-service department stores. And uh, they were very big. They started after the war in the 50s. They grew, 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 60s, 70s, and they were really big. They conquered uh, the country. And whenever such a big um, a hypermarket started somewhere in a village or a town in Germany, the rest of the uh, old retail was ended. So till about five to ten years ago, it started to go wrong, and it is going wrong even more. Kaufland. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them. That's the sister company of Lidl. And they are in big um, uh, hypermarkets as well. They could go up to 10,000 uh, square meters. Um, not going well at all. And they, uh, they see that the Kaufland goes, the, the, the sales per square meter goes up, 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 up to a certain about 3,000 square meters. And then the sales per square meter drop immediately. So they are now trying to recreate Kaufland and not make a Kaufland any bigger than 4,000 uh, square meter, which is a bit of a headache, because what do I do with the other 6,000 square meters? Um, Carrefour, the pioneer of hypermarkets, is in the same situation. They were, of course, the no compromise player in France since the 1970s. When Carrefour came to a town, it was over with all the uh, traditional retail. They were killed. Um, they still open uh, hypermarkets. This is in Tbilisi, in Georgia. Um, you see still relatively nicely filled shopping carts. This, but in the old days, when they started, a full shopping cart was like that. That was hypermarket shopping. That's something I can remember from the 1980s and early 1990s in Sweden as well, where daddy went with the kids to the hypermarket on Sunday morning, mama could stay in bed, and papa bought then uh, the shopping for the whole week and went home after they had eaten in the restaurant of the hypermarket there as well. Well, those days are over and we see all over the world that the old idea of supermarket, of, um, of big shopping, weekly shopping in the weekend, and then hardly any shopping in the week, it's in most countries over. Is that true here as well? Is your weekend shopping over too? Yeah. Um, so what you see now is that they, in Carrefour in, um, in uh, Georgia, and uh, this is a very funny script. It has nothing to do with the Russian script, is it? It's uh, completely different. I couldn't read it anyway. Um, and, uh, but you see, this is not big shopping at all. So what you see in towns outside Tbilisi, because they first opened in Tbilisi, um, outside Tbilisi, they now don't open anymore with a hypermarket. They open with a Carrefour market, which is no non-food. Only near food, but no non-food anymore. And... Um, this is in the town of Tevala, Telava, Tevala, one or the other. It's about 2,000 square meters. It's a nice supermarket, big with fresh, big with prepared uh, food, uh, big with action offers, promotion offers, and a very good everyday low prices um, uh, position. So that means that they are seen as uh, the cheapest in the market with a beautiful store. <coughs> and they leave... Um, Fashion, they leave to chains like LC Waikiki, that's a Turkish uh, chain. They are on a price level that Carrefour used to have in, uh, in fashion, but it's a much nicer feeling, like an H&M, um, uh, they do it there. Or uh, white and brown goods, electronics, which used to be very big in hypermarkets, it's all over now, and it's in specialist uh, chains as well. And this is what we see in many uh, countries. Um, if we look no compromise, we also have to look in products. Um, because the no compromise curve is determining products and assortment architecture as well. And I'm sure there are category managers in the house. Who is category manager? Aha, 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 right. So then this is your chapter. Um, uh, these were the good old FMCG brands, the food brands, the A brands, yeah, the big brands the B brands and the C brands. 
that was the old uh, way that uh, we were taught in the past that it should be. And uh, where did we position them, of course? Not on the diagonal, but that's where they started out. The A branch there, the B branch there, and the C branch there. And in the old days, before private label was invented, these brands were made by the industry. They were brands that belonged to the vendors, not to the, uh, to the retailer. So um, what happened then? More and more A brands came up there. That was uh, where the... It was price compromise, so it's the added value of the big brand. But um, uh, you have to pay for it. And then uh, the private labels, basic, is what you have as well. Um, the no compromise brand and the premium brand. And funny enough, I recognized in your stores these as well. Um, so how do they uh, go? They go on this no compromise diagonal again. Uh, so that means that uh, that's your no compromise brand, that's your basic brand, and that's your premium brand. And they should have price distances if they want to be really effective of 40, 50 percent, this 60 to 70 percent, and that zero, uh, 40 percent up. So that was the thinking that was pioneered by Tesco in, I would guess, the 90s, 1990s. They pioneered it like, uh, like that. And this is how the um, assortment architecture is of many uh, supermarket chains around the world. Um, and then, of course, if you have those private labels in place, you can start rationalizing defenders brands. So, C brands, who, who wants C brands if we have our own basic? Um, the B brands, which were unclear anyway, it's a bit of everything, so it's nothing. So, that went out, and you saw that they started rationalizing the A brands as well. And this, uh, since I would guess the 2000, 2005, 2010, you see this much more coming up in supermarkets around the world, uh, <coughs> that the assortment looks like uh, that. Um, so uh, this looks uh, like the rational assortment, but what you see is the basics have gone in most uh, countries. The upmarket specials, the premiums, they're gone as well, because um, what retailers found is that the rotation and the volume is far too low to, uh, to make it happy. And you see them playing the game much more like this. Um, so, to fight off uh, hard discounters, full-service retailers, and that's you too in your thinking still, uh, can go a bit overboard in richness of assortment. Um, I don't know if any of you have been in Zurheide near Dusseldorf. It's a very luxurious uh, supermarket. It's a bit like the Harrods of supermarket shopping in Germany. And we counted there 91 skews of honey. 91. Well, who can select a honey? You have to be a professor in the honey geology to be able to understand that. Um, but funny enough, yesterday I took this picture in uh, one of your stores. So, where would I put some of the Lithuanian players on the field after my one and a half day of uh, very selective uh, shopping? In Bidronka, Poland, very successful discounter, as you probably all know. Um, we saw only two types of honey. Um, it's not unsuccessful, they open one store per day, goes very good. And if you then ask the producers, and the retailers, what is a good assortment, many of them will tell you that that is a bad assortment and that's a good assortment. But according to the consumer, it's not true at all. What she thinks is that's a far better assortment than that. Otherwise, I cannot explain the success of Bidronka because it is doing it, or the success of Aldi South or Aldi uh, North. So, Please bear in mind all the time when creating value is keep the consumer in mind all the time. Good. Um, and don't believe me, look at market shares. Uh, if you uh, take market share in money in uh, Germany, 43% of the market in money is in the hands of the discounters. 
and that means about 65% in volume because they're cheaper. So the, the volume is, is there. There are big categories where the uh, volume of, uh, of the discounters is almost 100%. If you think of uh, fruit juices, I think the uh, market share of Aldi and Lidl in uh, Germany uh, probably in the 90-95% um, range. So, um, some solutions to improve price trust for price compromise chains, because that's what I heard this morning, how can we get from 7% to 10%? Well, after one and a half day, I'm sorry, I cannot tell you the magic secret yet how to do that, um, but what I can do is I can share some uh, ideas that uh, we created. Belgium, so they're all over the place, and um, I, I share just some, some ideas here. Okay. So, um, I'm looking at the clock, yes, we're getting there. Did we learn something this afternoon, guys and girls? Yes? Um, and you think you can do something with it next year? I hope so. And today, hope so too. So, now it's time for questions. <laughs>